Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian here at the Dubai Air Show. Our coverage here is sponsored by FLIR Systems, and we are aboard Boeing 787-10, the third developmental aircraft and uh, the 565th 787 produced by the company. And uh, joining us is Randy Tinseth, who is the uh, Vice President for Sales at the Boeing Commercial uh, Airplane Company. Randy, thanks very much for taking time for us. And welcome aboard. Um, it's, it's great to be aboard. Uh, and talk to us and bring us up to speed on the program. Uh, you guys uh, have been working on one derivative after another. Uh, talk to us about the flight test program and where you are. This is a flight test airplane mm -hmm. with albeit a smaller flight test kit. And I want to get yeah. a little bit of your past experience on that as well. Talk to us where you are on the program. So this is a 787-10, an airplane that uh, began its flight test program this year. It will be the first airplane uh, delivery, I guess, will be next year for the 787-10 to Singapore Airlines. Uh, this is the largest member of the family. It's about six meters longer than the 787-9, which means it carries about 320 passengers. 330 passengers is about 40 more passengers than the Dash 9. And by the way, when it enters service next year, be the most efficient airplane Boeing's ever built. And talk to us about the range capability of the airplane, because everybody wants that point-to-point -point, uh, ability. What kind of range are you getting out of the jet? Simple, 12 hours. <laughs> so if you want to fly 12 hours, this is the right airplane. So 12 hours, 90% of all wide-body, long-range markets today, this airplane can fly. And as I said, it can do it more efficiently than any aircraft we've ever built. Um, I know it may be a little bit early to ask you about more derivatives, but you have worked up that derivative a uh, number of aircraft on a pretty aggressive schedule in terms of what you guys have done with this program, uh, albeit while you were trying to work through also the backlog on, on the program, which you've eaten your way through. Are you guys envisioning any other derivatives of there? Is there a Dash 11, 12, 14, 429 as you guys are working this? Well, I think the answer to that is no. Never know where we will go. But when we built the 787 family, we envisioned an 8, 9, and a 10. And then when we developed and designed the 777X, we designed aircraft that had size and range to complement what we did on the 787-10. So if you want a 787-10 plus or a 787-11, that's that 777-8 that's going to come to service in 2022. Um, you guys uh, made an enormous amount of investment in the in the triple seven uh, program to modernize it. We visited last year and we saw the all composite wing line, which was uh, which was amazing, and some terrific equipment out there. But let me back up uh, one step, asking about seven eighty seven. One of the uh, challenges and questions was, hey, look, it's an all composite airplane. It is game changing in some of its characteristics, but also some operational concerns, uh, whether for cracking and a whole bunch of other things that go with that. Um, talk to us a little bit about some of the operational lessons you're drawing from the field that help you uh, make both design tweaks on the line, but also figure out how to better support the jets in, 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 uh, in service. I've got to tell you, when the airplane went into service, it was tough. It was really tough. We were coming up to speed in what the airplane could do. Our customers were challenged a bit. Today, a little over six years later, it is the most reliable airplane in this size category. In fact, it's 99.4% reliable. It's second only to the 777. So it's meeting our expectations, well frankly I have to say it's exceeding our expectations today. So not only is it reliable, not only has it opened up more than 160 new markets around the world, on average 787s are flying more than 12 hours a day, which is critically important to our customers. Fly 12 hours a day, 99.4% reliable, open up new markets. It's really performing today as we really envisioned back in 2004 when we launched the program. Um, you guys are very busy, uh, a lot going on. Bring us up to speed on the uh, 777X program. Um, you know, where are you on that? Give us an update. So whether it be the MAX, 787-10, or the 777X programs, I can tell you one thing. They're not on schedule. They're all a bit ahead of schedule. So in fact, the 777X, we just went and worked with a couple of our customers. We moved a few deliveries a little bit sooner in order to accommodate that development program that's going better than expected. We actually, uh, frankly, started building our first parts for the airplane, went into final assembly for some of those products. I think we were working on the wing just last week. So the first airplane's coming together. We'll be building test vehicles. The aircraft will go to flight test next year, and then it's on track to deliver in 2020. Um, talk to us a little bit about uh, M MMA. Uh, the middle of the market aircraft is something you guys did an extraordinary study. Uh, not, not that extraordinary. 
<laughs> Welcome to a real air show. Yeah. Uh, um, you guys uh, did a lot of studies. You went to all your customers. Yeah, you've been doing the legwork to try to determine what this next 767 sized airplane would be, roughly. What are you guys finding? Have you solidified a design, and how far out are you from doing that? You know, what are some of the core characteristics the jet needs? Well, it looks like it's going to be a family of aircraft, a smaller uh, airplane that flies a bit further and a bigger airplane that doesn't quite fly as far. It's really an airplane family that's targeting the market between the very successful 737 family and the 787. I don't want to call it a tweener, but frankly it is middle of the market airplane because it's in the middle of the market. It's a market that's not being served today. Now when we went out and talked to now more than 50 customers, you know, we kind of tried to use maybe the 757 as a benchmark for the kind of airplane in terms of size and range they looked at. And what they told us, they want an airplane that's about 20% larger than a 757, that flies about 20, 25% further, and has about 30% better efficiency than that 757. We looked at building new 57s, new engines, new wings. We looked at re-winging, re-engining the 767. The only way we could figure to really bring that airplane to the market is an all new design, and that's where our focus is today. Um, and uh, why, why didn't you, because there were some folks who were talking, hey, they worked for the A, uh, A330, uh, they did a Neo version of that jet at a fraction of the cost. Um, why, why not do a 767 re-engine, especially when you've got some interest from uh, United in particular, uh, you know, that, that line closed four years ago for the, for the PAX version uh, of it. Why not do a re-engine on it? Well, this middle of the market airplane is a is an airplane that's really focusing on the market where a single aisle airplane today just doesn't have the capabilities in terms of range or size and a wide body like the A330 is just too big and expensive to operate. So it's a smaller airplane, a more efficient airplane, an airplane like the 787 will be able to open up really this whole new um, set of markets uh, like the 787 did. Um, let me ask you, um, long-term uh, traffic growth assumption um, in the Boeing 20-year outlook is 4.8%, uh, with, and that's eight-year above trend sort of average uh, on that. Yeah. Where do those figures look? Because, you know, do, do you expect that to grow below mean? Talk to us about where you guys are expecting some of I these figures to go. look out the next three to five years, we're expecting to continue to see a pretty darn robust market. Uh, that market's going to be driven by low-cost carriers that are growing around the world. The market will be driven by airlines in the emerging and developing economies. You know, we're just really continuing to see those markets perform above expectations. Uh, frankly, the other part of the, the market that's been very exciting is some of the mature markets like the United States and Europe. They're gr growing at rates we haven't seen for a number of years. Economy's growing strong, prices are going down, our customers are finding new and better ways to serve the marketplace, and that's all good news. That's why we expect the market to continue to grow, probably a little bit above uh, long-term trend for the next couple of years. So you think you'd be increasing that mean from 4.8%? You know, why not a higher number? That's what some I, guys on the street are asking. I tell you, this is a 20-year number, and over 20 years, that's still a pretty big number. The base gets larger and larger and larger, but I can tell you, the first 10 years of the forecast is going to grow at a higher rate. We'll just have to see how that works out. i got to tell you, though, our customers are managing their business like nothing we've ever seen. Over the last 10 years, for example, we've seen load factors grow by four points, four points. We've seen airplane utilization go up 15%. So the capabilities, or I should say the productivity of airplanes over that 10 year period have essentially added 4,000 new aircraft to the market. Now frankly, I don't think we'll be able to add that kind of productivity in the next few years. So if the airlines are going to grow, they're going to need new airplanes. That's why we're going up in rate. Uh, do you, um, uh, we talked about this in in, uh, in Paris as well, where I asked you that MMA question. So your answer was pretty much consistent uh, with what you said there. Um, uh, well, the truth sets you free. <laughs> yeah, the truth, the truth will set you free. Yes, and for all of you who need spiritual healing, you can you can come come to Randy for for any uh, any disgruntled airplane people who who need soothing. Except I guess unless you're an Airbus person, in which case you might you might get it's irritated. Been a tough story for them. Oh, 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 oh. We're going to go and we're going to talk yeah. to them as well. But uh, uh, talk to us a little bit about the Middle East market. I mean, there are still folks who are looking at this market and saying that it's soft. If you look at some of the uh, ticket uh, folks are getting twenty two hundred dollar business class tickets on some of the Gulf carriers. Uh, the coach tickets are also relatively inexpensive, mm -hmm. uh, and and folks are looking at that and saying like, look, I mean, financially, you know, there, there have been some warning signs that have come up. There have been some warning signs in Asia that have come up since last we spoke. Are you are you still bullish? I mean, are are there reasons to be concerned out there? Are there challenges in this market? Absolutely. 
the economy is not growing as fast as we'd like to see it. Uh, frankly, as you all, as everyone knows, there are a number of geopolitical challenges in this market. But on the good side, traffic growth is down, but it's still growing at 7%. Cargo traffic as, is actually for the first nine months of the year growing at 9%. So we're seeing some good performance in the market. We're also seeing uh, markets like Turkey come back. We're seeing airlines like Ro Royal Jordanian uh, making profit for the first time in a long time. So there's some good signs as well. I think the one thing you'll say is that the airlines here are working hard to manage their business. Um, airlines like uh, Itihad and um, Emirates have cut back in terms of their schedules. They've pulled airplanes out, they've retired aircraft. And I think we're optimistic because as we look at those airplanes that have to deliver over the next uh, 5, 10, 15 years here, most of them are for replacement. Uh, we believe the airplanes that are flying today will have to be replaced. 777X is primarily a replacement airplane in this market. Maybe the 787 that Emirates signed up for today is going to be a growth uh, vehicle, but that's a much smaller airplane than they've flown in the past. So we think they're going in the right direction. Um, let me uh, ask you about the C-Series. Uh, you guys uh, brought the suit to the Commerce Department. The Commerce Department did back you guys, uh, putting in a very, very large tariff on, on Bombardier. There was a little bit of celebrating that, hey, you know, we, we, we stopped this uh, plane that was viewed as a threat, a uh, developing threat for, for some time. Uh, you know, the perception by some on the market was that, you know, Boeing had not taken some past threats seriously, and so this one was acting kind of proactively to stop it. Um, but. Uh, you know, in, in what some folks consider to be kind of a really uh, bold uh, move, uh, Airbus went in buying a big stake in the program and saying that it's going to manufacture those planes in the United States. Uh, what sort of a threat does that constitute to Boeing, to your guys' sales plan, and how do you intend to respond to that? Okay. Well, first of all, no change in strategy. We believe with the Max family, we have the right family moving forward. When we look at that 100 to 150 seat market, Max 7 is slightly bigger than our competition. It's more fuel efficient per passenger than the competition and frankly has more range. So we think we have the right airplane. The question and the challenge we've had is not cost, it's about price. Bombardier came into the market, they sold airplanes in our market at a price that we believe was much below the cost of building the aircraft. Frankly, you look at the airplane, it's a nice airplane, it's a good airplane, but it is expensive to build. Frankly, it's expensive to build. And when you take a look at an airline or a company like Airbus coming in, they're going to bring their whole set of costs and complexity to the situation. I think they're going to struggle to get costs out. So I think they paid a dollar, uh, maybe a dollar, Canadian dollar for this partnership. Maybe they got what they paid for. Um, ooh, 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 we're going to be uh, talking to the Bombardier folks as well. So I'll say like, hey, you know, Randy, uh, that was Randy's take on that. the company for a dollar. Uh, um, but, 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 you know, you know, we've gone through this, we've bought companies, we've integrated them. Uh, there is a challenge about um, how do you integrate, how do you take complexity out? And frankly, Airbus has a lot of things on their plate right now. Uh, bringing and setting up new production lines, trying to integrate into a culture. Will they really take cost out? Will they really make the system better? It's yet to be determined. I, but the specific question, though, that folks are saying regarding the Bombardier issue is that on that Delta competition, you guys were not in it. You guys had offered some Embraer airplanes. Delta was not interested in that. They ended up going with the, the C-Series aircraft. You know, how do you respond to the counter charge folks make is, look, you guys didn't even have a dog in this fight. You're just trying to use this as an excuse to block another guy who's got a great and competitive product. Well, the question is, is it a great competitive product? Did you come to the market, sell it below cost? And frankly, it's not just the CS100, it's also the 300, the potential 500, what's going on in that marketplace? Our government took action, we support that action. Um, uh, what about uh, speculation that you guys would then try to move into a deal with Embraer, for example, and have a partnership to get an airplane that's on that smaller size in the market? The question is about market size, market depth. Is the market there? We got a great airplane in the 100 to 150 seat market with the Max 7. We're not going to change that strategy. Let me go and ask you about China. A lot of Chinese money has been moving into the leasing market. That's got some folks uh, a little bit concerned regarding transparency and a whole bunch of other things. You're in this business. You know, are there any concerns? Uh, you know, is it is it a good thing, not a good thing? Is it something that we're going to see in a couple of years' time? I think it's very simple. The aviation business, buying um, and selling airplanes in the lease market is a good business, attractive margins. That's why the Chinese are coming to this marketplace. Uh, and let me ask you, um, uh, well, 
Do you think do you think that the C Series guys are going to sell six thousand airplanes? I mean, is that twenty year market so, projection so our, they have? Our forecast is thirty thousand single aisle airplanes over the next twenty years. About twenty five percent of that will be towards the larger segment, the seven and three seven max nine and ten. The middle part of the market, the heart of the market, will be around the max eight. That's going to be somewhere between sixty and sixty five percent. You do the math, that means ten, maybe fifteen percent of the market in the lower part, that one hundred to five hundred seat or one hundred to one hundred fifty seat market. I don't see six thousand airplanes. The math just doesn't add up. And remember, the last time we saw a successful hundred seater, do you remember it? DC nine. It's yeah. been a long time. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say. So it's about the market, it's about the cost to build. That's the challenge. Was that a mistake, putting the 717 to, to bed? I, we struggled with cost on that program. You know, landing gear for a 100-seater aren't that much different than a 150-seater. Systems for a 100-seater aren't that much. Right. Just expensive to build airplanes in that segment for the price that airlines are willing to pay. Um, and I, I'm sure that Air, uh, Bombardier is finding that out. I've got two quick questions before Paul gives us the hook over yeah, here, because he's, he's, he's smiling, but, I, but his eyes are saying, wrap this up. Uh, let me, uh, <laughs> that was Paul Lewis, the legendary <laughs> former journalist and, uh, and uh, you know, aviation icon and spokesman at the Boeing company. Uh, he's got the funny accent, though. He does, he does have a funny accent, but it is endearing to some of us. Uh, all of this is, by the way, staying in because it's part of the, the, the Randy Paul Vago floor show. Um, let me uh, take you to a quick question. John Leahy, legend in the business, mm -hmm. put Airbus on the map, uh, has, uh, you know, locked in a competition my entire career, your entire career, uh, between, between the two companies companies um, and has, has tended to do pretty well. Uh, mm -hmm. Some people consider him the history's all-time greatest salesman. Yeah. Uh, rumors of his retirement <laughs> seem to always be exaggerated, uh, and he's still there. Um, what, do you, what, do you, what, what do you see as somebody who's, who's been beaten by him and you've beaten him, but somebody who's such a giant in, in the business? Um, how do you think the post, that post-Airbus looks, you know, in, how does Airbus look in a post uh, Leahy era. Well, I, I think we still have to, to find that out. Uh, frankly, um, um, John has made a great contribution to this industry. He's been great at what he's been able to do at Airbus. I'm just happy that the last five years we've been able to out deliver them and we're on the verge of out delivering them again this year. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Randy said with some satisfaction. Now, I want to go back. You were an electrical engineer. Yep. Uh, you weren't always somebody who was moving airplanes off the lot, uh, you know, crazy Randy's uh, airplane lot, but you were actually part of the flight test uh, team flight at Boeing and as, as part of the instrumentation team. Talk to us about what you used to do then on which programs and how it's changed. So I got to tell you, so I was the guy that helped develop and design not the racks, but some of the things that went in the racks. So we could take the information and data from the many sensors on this airplane, try to figure out if the airplane's performing as expected. You know, I, I felt a little old a little earlier this year because the last program I worked in flight test was the 747-400, an airplane that we delivered to Northwest Airlines back in 1989, about the time I came to marketing. I was just at a celebration earlier this year at Delta, and guess what we did? We retired that very same airplane. The last one I worked on is part of their museum now. Spectacular airplane. I wouldn't take give my uh, engineer. I wouldn't give away my engineering days. They were fabulous, but I really like what I'm doing now. Um. And uh, a shout out to Joe Sutter, the, the legend uh, who passed last year, uh, sadly, uh, who was the father of the 747. Do you have a, a tinge of sadness as 74s are beginning to retire from service? Uh, United retired it uh, last week. Uh, we've seen other retirements coming. Is that kind of a bittersweet moment for you? It's, it's a bittersweet moment. I, you know, frankly, the first programs I worked on were the 57 and, and the 67. So probably the hardest for me was to latch, watch the last delivery of the 757. I watched the first one fly. I watched the last one fly and deliver to Shanghai. Airlines. Uh, uh, frankly, the good news for me is I think the 67 actually went up in rate this year. Uh, that was the other first airplane I, I, I was part of, and frankly, I'll be long gone and probably buried and dead, and we're still going to be building 767s, so that makes me feel good. Uh, last thing, United asked you for those 767s. At what point do you commit to that? Because that line closed four years ago. Uh, I didn't mean this, I'd forgotten, I wanted to ask you that question. The line did close from a passenger aircraft perspective. How seriously are you looking at restarting production on that? 767-300ER is open and ready for business. The last one we did deliver was about four years ago, but if we have a customer that's interested in it, we got the capability. Fantastic. Well, when would you make that decision, do you know? We got the capability. <laughs> Randy, thanks very much. Thank you.